Hey everybody, welcome back to Will Work for a Podcast. As always, I'm Daniel Thornton, and with me is Brendan Boland. And uh, yeah, welcome back. How's it? What? That's no, no good. I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just going ahead of myself. <laughs> Sorry, go, go, go. Because <laughs> you forgot your name again. No, it's just like I, I do think it's funny that uh, me saying my name in that space. Like I don't know. It's a. Uh, but anyways, um, it, it's it's a little. I was bit trying. After. I was trying to make it laugh without actually calling attention to our audience. But you know, whatever. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're a visual medium now too. You well, know? that's it. That's it. It was more of an aside. You know, it's. Uh... <laughs> oh man. So, not like, uh, how's it been going with your week? And anything, anything new happening in the, uh, in the meditation space? Oh, um, <laughs> uh, n- no. Uh, I mean, like, you know, <laughs> you know. Here's a good question because we were talking about this, and I know you weren't on uh, Daniel C's uh, interview, but you know, we talked about the, um. That we talked about the virtual, not the, vir- the technological sub- Sabbath. So yeah. is that something like preached in some of the stuff that you do? Like, has that, is that a part of like, you well, know, like, TV? I don't know. Yeah. I think in the reflection that we did, or, you know, sorry. Um, I think stillness is a concept that gets brought up a lot, right? So whether you're doing, whether you're creating like meditation, which can take on a lot of forms, right? One right. of which I think is, is beautiful. It's just literally like doing something that brings you joy. Right. So if, if taking a walk, going, playing a sport, um, going to the gym even could be it for some people. Cause it's just that creating opportunities where your mind is at ease and is not like over processing. Right. And so I think with the, the technical sabbatical aspect of it, I think is inherent within that kind of space, you know, like one thing I thought he, that from, from, Oh, we're not reflecting, but one thing you'll hear in the interview is him talking about like, even the fact that so many of us are listening to something throughout the day. And I can, I can speak to myself, right? I have my AirPods in almost all day now, right? Whether it's, right. it's got music, it's got a podcast, it's got some sort of content. I'm, I'm, re- I'm like reading books while I'm doing work now, right? Because I'm trying to stay engaged because I don't have the uh, those around me like I used to. So I think, um, you know, for everyone, we can always benefit from some sort of stillness. Yeah, I just like don't understand how you would accomplish a whole day of no technology i don't need i guess you would like leave you got to go to thor's cabin or something like that to, in order to do this stuff I, I mean when's the last time you took a day hike i don't know man <laughs> like a, a year like a while ago yeah yeah well and even that right and even for a lot of people now who use like all trails which is a great app i'd recommend it for anyone that's looking for that you know you're, you're pulling out your phone to check the map right, and right. Maybe you're going this way and then you'll see something so i think you know, like it, it reminds me of my dad who used to like have a paper map somehow and a compass. My, my dad always took a paper map, a compass and a snake bite kit, which always freaked me out as a tiny kid. Cause I'm like, why <laughs> do we need the snake bite kit? And he's just like, you never know. Right? You never so, know. <laughs> always be prepared. And for a four year old, that's serious. It's like, oh, I'm going to get bitten by a snake. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm going to die out of here. <laughs> but, but that's, that's the idea too. Right. So like, I think it sounds daunting. It sounds like a big task. And I think what, what Daniel was just trying to tell us is try it, right? See if you can go, for a few hours or a day, don't don't use the TV, don't you know use your phone for whatever, and and try an alternative, right? You know, and I think with you being in DC, like jump on the subway and see where you go, right, and things like that, rather than right. rather than using your phone to to support that adventure. I guess that's true, and you know, I'd love to hear some stories about somebody else taking like some sabbaticals, and so you know. Reach out to us on LinkedIn, guys. You know, we're always here. You can, we'll be more than happy to accept your friend request or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, tell us some stories from how you may have taken a, a day hike or a sabbatical from your technology. We're at willworkforpodcast at gmail.com. It's willwork, the number four podcast at gmail.com. Like and subscribe. Follow us on, on the Instagram, on everything, on the TikTok. We, we're all out there and uh, just be a part of our community. Well, all we right. come to our rejection letter of the week. And, uh, you know, where did this come from, Brennan? Yeah, so this actually came from uh, one of our listeners. Appreciate the email. Um, so they say, hi, person. Thank you for the application for the role, uh, sp- specialist role here at the organization. We enjoyed getting to know you through your biography, resume, and interview. At this time, we will not be moving forward with your application. 
We appreciated hearing about your investment in healing and liberation, as well as the ways in which you led to bring equity between uh, people in your workplace. Stay connected to us through Instagram and our newsletter. Our work continues to grow and your skills may be a great, great fit for a future role or collaboration. I like this. With respect and joy, the team. And That's nice. Uh, yeah, so that came, I think, about a week. This person said a week after they had done a phone interview. So just first round interview for this position. I think that's good. A week. It's at, they pointed out something they liked about the person, which I appreciated. It's like, and it it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, you know, elaborate. It just has to be like, hey, you know what? We decided to go another way. Thank you. You sound like here's a cool thing you did. Let's move on with our lives and keep applying. I think I yeah. think this idea actually is legitimate, especially for these small teams that are growing. Like we're gonna have more things in the future. We mm. we 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 appreciate you being part of our community as it is, and keep keep coming back. Right, keep seeing and trying to be. Uh, you know, if you feel like this is a good fit, maybe we will too in the future. Yeah. Well, that was a good rejection letter. Always nice to have a good one. Thank you to the listener, and uh, on with the show. Well, everyone, we'd like to welcome to the show Vic Kapoor. Uh, he's a certified, he's an ICF certified professional coach at the PCC level who helps his clients utilize their strengths, dial down the drama, and find meaning in every area of life. Though he works with a range of middle managers and senior executives, his focus on emerging leaders and rising stars. Hey, Vic, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hopefully we are one of those rising stars you're, you know, taken under your wing. But uh, yeah, I thought that we could just start out with something brief about, you know, telling telling about us about yourself and then we can kind of go into like leadership skills and stuff like that. So please, Vic, you have the floor for a little bit. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you. I uh, run a coaching company that has clients all over the world. Uh, I've had the good privilege of working with the United Nations where I built a team of 80 coaches in 40 countries. So that gives me a little bit of depth and perspective. Um, and I also, just so you have some context, I coach people who are trying to get into college. So like, you know, very early in their careers, all the way up to heads of government agencies, members of the U.S. Special Forces, ambassadors and whatnot. So um, I was a trial lawyer by background. I'm also a facilitator, a trainer and mediator. And um, yeah, married. Thinking of having kids, you know, living the hey. game. <laughs> Dude, they're all, po everybody I know is popping out kids. So <laughs> congrats if you decide to go down that path too. But yes, and we'd like to also give a shout out to Chad Ryerson, who is also a friend of the show, who said that Nick should come on. So that's why he was so gracious enough to come on here. But yeah, I, that's, that's amazing that you're, have such a like reach, you know, across all these markets, about uh, across all these people. Um, what got you into coaching, I guess? Like, what, what was the journey there? I went to be a mediator at FEMA mm -hmm. in Homeland Security, and my team was doing a lot of coaching. And I didn't know what it was, but I got involved in it in a conflict coaching capacity. Very quickly realized I loved it. Just really nice mix of asking good questions, you know, that trial background that I had, and um, helping people grow and develop and um, just finding ways to move past setbacks or to get unstuck and really drawing on neuroscience, the behavioral stuff that I really like. So very quickly, I think it was like day three of coaching. Someone asked me, how many years have you been doing this? And so I thought, hey, well, I really enjoy this. People think I'm good at it. So I was able to, to develop that. And I wrote a book last year on self-coaching for young leaders. So I took my toolkit that I had developed and interviewed some of the leaders around the world who are using it. And, uh, and was able to put that together in a book. But uh, for me, it's just been a great blessing, great journey. I didn't sign up for it. You know, I was kind of thrown into the mix and, <laughs> and then realized it's just uh, really probably my calling. Well, that's fantastic. So we talk, we've had a lot of coaches on here. We have Chad, we have a lot of other mm -hmm. career coaches on. And so I would love, since you work with so many different levels of people over your span of your career as a coach, I would love to kind of get into a different area today and because since a lot of our listeners are early career people and I think about this all the time as well, when you're in junior positions, you know, we always see those upper echelon, the senior management, all those kind of things. And 
we think to ourselves, oh, maybe one day we can get there. Oh, that maybe that's the that's the path we can do. But we often don't know like how to develop those skills. So how do you develop leadership skills while working in lower levels and not and not managing anyone if you're not if you're just uh you know on the bottom? Yeah, it's this idea of natural leadership, right? We don't mm-hmm. need to be a leader with a title. So how can you lead from behind? Right. And it's, some of those are cliches, but really I've seen them in action, right? Is how do you galvanize a group behind a change management process? How do you anticipate what your leader needs with vision, right? Um, mm-hmm. How do you get involved in volunteer capacities with Rotary International or some other group that allows you to facilitate teams maybe globally or to facilitate people who are much older than you, more seasoned than you, because a lot of it is about likability. It's about building trust quickly. It's about anticipating people's needs in advance and a lot of self-awareness, really recognizing what is your, your dominant conflict style? You know, what are some of the patterns of behavior that you exhibit and what are your strengths? What are the superpower potentials? And then when you overuse your strength, what happens? And can you pay attention to that as well? Right. So that's just a little snippet, right, of how I might explore that. But um, it's about identifying gaps early on, getting the mentors, and then um, having your eyes on the idea that any moment you might get thrown in there, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, are you ready for it at that moment? So just building up for that. Well, that's a really good. I see that there's a lot, a lot of sound principles like inside of all that, uh, all that stuff that you've been talking about and what you coach on the people that you have on, on your on your sites and who come to see you. And so I I really wanted to like dig down deep inside of that and see, just just to give some tips, tools, not the whole you know secret sauce, but something to help people get started and maybe reach out to a coach like you. Um. So we're just going to go through a little bit of an exercise here. So I'm going to I'm going to lay out a scenario for you and then you're going to just help me get some advice of how I would move forward from where I am at to where I want to be. So here's here's a simple scenario, all right? So I'm a project manager at a company. Let's say I'm in international development or I'm in government, doesn't really matter. Um and I want to get into the senior project manager role. And I and I know that there are five senior project manager roles. There's only going to ever be five. That's just like the structure of the company. And I see that maybe I, I have a feeling, maybe I've talked to my supervisor who is an SBM, or I've talked to another person, another uh, senior project manager. And, and it's like, seems like in a, in a few years, in three years, let's say, I know that there's going to be a position opened up. Okay, well, that's great. But I also know there are a lot of other project managers in my section, in other sections, probably going to be vying for this job. So how do I get myself into a position where I know in the next three years, I'm going to be at the forefront of that conversation? Like they're going to look at me and say, Daniel, you're going to be the SBM. So like, how does that happen? Right. I think that's a great question. And so sometimes that does happen. It happens because you've established that rapport and that trust, or maybe you have a certain skill set. Maybe, for instance, you know the analytics better than other people, or the return on investment, or you're a learner, and you're always bringing the cutting-edge stuff to the team, and people see that. Or you're the one that's able to take a lot of disagreement in a meeting and synthesize it and present it back to people in a way where they can make a decision quickly. Right. right. So if the leader is looking to you for certain skills that they're maybe lacking – if there's a reciprocal mentoring going on where you're really uh, empowering them as well, sometimes they've hand selected that person, right? And they put them in leadership <laughs> yeah. and opportunities they've given them when they're out on vacation, they make you the acting, right? Mm-hmm. So you can start to see if it's being telegraphed that way. But I hate to say it. A lot of times they hire the outsider too, right? So you can position yourself all you want and be ready for it. But some error you made early on in your career, some limitation could very well get in the way of that promotion later on. Hmm. Um, So I see that as a pitfall oftentimes when leaders will hire the outsider because it's like a quantity they don't know. So might as well go with that one and see maybe they'll stir it up. And that can create some challenges and conflicts for people, certainly. Um, But when you're on the inside, 
noticing, just noticing, is there a sense of their culture where people get promoted from the inside? Because in many places, that is the culture. And if that's the case, now how do you compete with these other two or three people, as you mentioned? It's a um, team of rivals kind of thing. Like, how do we lift each other up uh, while also allowing me to hone my distinctions, right? Mm-hmm. My strengths. And, um, and knowing that it's going to be a little bit of a crapshoot at the end anyway, because it's a, it's a little bit of likability. It's a little bit of um, fit for the entire team. There might be uh, some elements of style or personality or things like that that would come into play. So, so just also knowing, do I feel good working here? Do I care about the values in this place? Am I promoting the right values or am I constantly having to be the honey badger, the one protesting and pushing back <laughs> and that kind of thing, right? Um, so those are some things. I mean, I feel like I've had personal experience on all sides of that where I was sort of, someone set me up for success in a role. Other times it felt like I was going to really have to compete for it and that somebody else was set up for it. Right. And, um, so sometimes you don't want to swim upstream on these things. Right. And, but it's a values judgment. Maybe you do want to, you know, quote unquote, die on this hill. Maybe this is the big dream. And if mm-hmm. so, then you double down on it. Like what? And maybe, maybe somehow inquire, get the right mentors, get the leverage, because it may be what people are saying behind your back that's important, right? When well, that's interesting. Shakes- I, I just to just to interrupt you there. I, yeah. I'm so now I'm interested into something. Two things you said. Some some things you said about leadership uh, going outside. You deal with a lot of senior management and leadership and things along that nature. Do you? When you are talking with these people, do you tell them to go to hire within? Do you what? What do you as seen as the most successful, like way way forward? Well, I often I don't tell a lot. I often ask. I ask mm-hmm. what what are the what's the perception going to be like if you hire the internal person? What would it be like if you hired the out? You know, just checking the gut check of culture wise. What's it like when you bring someone in? Um, Sometimes there's a very strong, compelling reason for that. They want a particular viewpoint or they Mm -hmm. want someone who wants to, they want a transformer, somebody who's going to change the whole culture and, and the person on the inside feels too much like the old guard. Mm -hmm. So um, I won't advise in that regard, but I do give people a sense of trends that look, when you do hire the outside person, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. And then you have to be ready with what you're going to do about that blowback. And um, how do you manage the attrition potentially that might occur, the sabotage that might occur right. from the people internally? That's um, a good point. How do you help that? How do you coach that person so that they can build trust with that team quickly? Um, and, and yeah, what is the downside of uh, creating a culture where you're promoting from within? So it kind of seems like you don't feel, because so, just something you alluded to before when we were talking about this scenario. It kind of, like you said, that is if this is the hill you're going to die on. Let's say that you know, like, this is a crapshoot. So do you think that a better option would be to try to go outside? I, I guess when are the signs you know that you want to go outside the company or you want to stick with the company? Yeah, I mean, if you're growing every day, if you have somebody on your team that really values your achievements constantly, like at least once a week, uh, if you know uh, the, what's expected of you, your roles and responsibilities, and if you feel like you have the resources to get your job done, if there's very little conflict on your team, I mean, these are things to really give you pause if you've got that kind of setup already, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're feeling, you know, what Steve Jobs used to do, he'd look in the mirror every day in the morning and say, <laughs> is this what I want to be doing today? And if you say no to that question for six months or longer, then maybe it's time to go. You know, so, so, you know, it's, it's hard to base everything on whether you can be promoted because you may not even want that promotion when it comes or maybe your family life changes. Maybe you realize, well, gosh, the difference in income isn't even worth it or the stress or whatever it is. So um, certainly it's important to know whether there's upward growth, but maybe you learn different ways to navigate in the system. Maybe they give you special time for projects that you really are passionate about or you become an entrepreneur in a different way. Um, so oftentimes it's making the most of the situation you have is actually better than leaving. 
Mm. Uh, and sometimes you can promote yourself to the point of incompetence, right? You can get promoted, <laughs> to it, right? And uh, so I see, I do see people. Sag. Yeah, I do see people <laughs> jumping around in tech every year, every six months, whatever it is. And it's like you can tell on their nervous system this is no joke, right? This is like serious. If every yeah. year, year and a half, you're moving to a new company. Yeah, you're moving up real fast. You're making more money. Um, I don't know. I guess I have a little bit of a longer view on some of these things, right? Mm. Like I want you to be happy when you're 80 too. You're an old soul. You you see this as a long game because that's funny you say that uh, too. Do you see – is that a is that a is that a problem you usually see with leaders is like jumping around because that is a trend for our i guess for our um generation is you know you stay with a a uh, you stay with a job one year or two years and then you move on to the next job is that like something you see as a deficit for some people it's really such a, a valuable thing for them they get to constantly be growing and changing and shifting but I, I do see a lot of imposter syndrome. I do see a lot of anxiety. I do see a lot of conflict and people running from the hard stuff. Um, and I'm not saying there's no criticism for a particular generation or anything. I mean, even General Petraeus, you know, we interviewed him and he, he talks about imposter syndrome. I mean, it pops up everywhere. People right. are constantly moving around, um, and, but that takes a toll. And so I think really, um, if you spend enough time in one place to to get comfortable with the people management part, the diplomacy, the politics, the getting resources and bringing programs together, once you've got that down and you understand yourself, then you can move around a lot more. But I am running into people who are younger, who are very ambitious and who are bouncing around so much that they're not really concretizing their own leadership brand their values, their needs. It's becoming a little bit, uh, I would say, almost superficial or materialistic. I hate to generalize. Um, no, I that's, mean. That's what it feels like. That That's a great point. I swear to God, every time <laughs> every time I go to a new job, I'm like, oh, it, I, I can only be here a year because then after a year, they'll find out I'm incompetent and then I have to leave because I'm just like, I got to go. I got to find another job because it's you know, they'll figure it out because then at the first because the for the first six months, they're like, well, if you make a mistake, well, it's your first six months like you go. We could go on from there, whatever. But after that, it's like, well, you've been here for a while, like you should know this. And then it's like, well, if I leave before that time, then they'll think I'm great. So, yes, I totally understand that. And I guess how do you combat that? Like, what do you do? And now I'm getting more into mindset, which we talk about all the time here. But like as a mindset, you're hoping that one day you'll be a leader or even leaders themselves. What are some of the key traits to help combat those fight or flight like uh, uh, instincts? Yeah, I mean, so there's some very specific mindsets that you can be thinking about, right? We know about growth and fixed, right, as a paradigm. Mm -hmm. And if you're feeling like you're in a fixed mindset, then how can you shift to a more growth mindset? But there's also abundance and scarcity, Scarcity meaning there's not enough out there. I have, you know, it's win or win and lose, zero sum. If I miss out on an opportunity, I'm not going to get another one. That kind of thing. But you can shift that to abundance, where there's plenty. You know, there's plenty out there. I'm going to get something. It's going to be all good. My friend got this one. I'll get the next one. Kind of thing. You know, and uh, there's inward mindset, which is about me. It's all about me. And outward mindset, where it's really about service and it's about the other person and you know, making it about them and, and encouraging and that kind of thing. So if you're in a mindset that feels a little bit limiting or stuck, and my offer would be to kind of shift that. If you can notice it, to know what the more helpful mindset might be. And then as quickly as uh, in my book, we talk about this. Uh, Hira Ali is a Pakistani coach, and she came up with this brain flip. It's very easy. You notice the negative mindset, and then you say three, two, one, flip. And you flip it to the positive mindset and you challenge yourself talk that way. And it's, it sounds easy enough. You do it a few times and it becomes very intuitive where it's like, oh, I'm catching myself in a victim mindset right now. But I should be the player, the hero, not the victim. And so three, two, one, flip like this. You know, I'm, this is not happening to me. I, I am engaging with this thing. Right. Mm. So it, little stuff like that. That's that's a very good exercise to help. We that's a very great thing. Very good tips and tricks to tell to our audience. And so, I guess 
my question would then fall into like, what is a habit or, and it goes to like your, your example that you just gave, what's a habit that a good, that good leaders practice every day in order to be a good leader? I mean, if you look at like tools of Titans, I don't know if you're a Tim Ferriss fan, but like 60% of the people he interviewed around the world that are like top performers had one common practice and that's meditation mindfulness oh my god brendan is going to be so happy when he hears this oh my god (laughs) he's always telling me to meditate and i'm just too angry to do it i i don't know one day i'm going to bring in a meditation expert and i'm just going to meditate on air for like i'm I'm tempted to just (laughs) do it right now (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, so and you know for some people it's meditation where they're just silent and they can be with themselves. And for people like Tony Robbins and others are like, no way I can't do that. I have to be very active. Mm -hmm. And there's a neurodiversity to this too. We have to be mindful of that. There's some people that just don't want to meditate. And so for for you all, I would daydream, create a visualization. Imagine that future you're in the garden, you're retired, you're hanging at the gazebo, you're, you know, whatever it is, your Mai Tai and, you know, just <laughs> whatever relaxes you and gets you out of the negative thought pattern or the stressful thought pattern, right? That's what meditation is for. It also reduces your reactiveness and it changes the state of mind that you have. And so I would say that's one very important practice. And of course, another one is listening. Most leaders are not really listening. They're just running and they're not asking the right questions. They're not pondering. They're just... Um, an overload and they're paid to make really quick decisions. And so they love to just hand out advice all day long. And so I'm always pushing my leaders to say, you know, can you be a little bit more curious? You know, humble inquiry means you're asking questions where you don't really know the answer. It's not a leading question. Like, and, and just that pause, you know, so even a couple of seconds of breathing, um, I'll often get senior execs who are running meeting to meeting and they're 10 minutes behind or whatever it is. Well, does it really matter if you're one minute more behind? So take that minute, breathe, relax, you know, imagine for me, it's like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. That's the picture <laughs> I try to remember. Because if I'm playful, if I'm funny, if I'm naive, I'm not going to tear somebody a new one in, in this meeting, right? I'm not going to be upset uh, or I'm not going to feel under attack. So, so those are some. So creative visualization, meditation, breathing. The basics, huh? Yeah, I mean, those are all great things to reiterate. I, we, we have those. A lot of those themes come up with people who come into for the career coaches and then the success. But I like that uh, you put some simple points on to like take breaks during meetings. People tell me that all the time, and I, and I tell that I try to do that as much as possible because it's exhausting going from meeting to a meeting. So, um, yeah. I wanted to get to this topic of networking. We talked about this before in our pre-call and like every, we've talked about this uh, offline, but you know, it's just such a, it's such an important key tool to be able to do, especially early in your career, being able to like network with people because with decision makers, how do you, I just wonder how you network effectively while having a job and being open to other opportunities. I know we've talked about, like networking while not having a job, but why do you do, how do you do it while having a job? And then at different levels, uh, like if you're just a junior level or you're a more senior level, like I've never even know, I don't even know what that means. Like networking to be a VP who, who even knows, but yeah, I'd love to, for you to give us some insight. Sure. And I think everybody's going to have their own style to this, right? But for me, it's about mentoring and sponsorship and reciprocal mentoring. So what I'm doing is I'm hunting for people who are living their best lives, like lives that I would want to live. And I've probably built out and I work with my clients to build out three possible life plans, right? If you're on your current path and you continued along it and you went to the pinnacle of where you were on this path, where would you end up? And what if that path disappeared entirely? What would you do instead? And what would that path look like? And then uh, what would you do if time and money were no consequence? You could do anything you wanted, essentially. What would be that path? And this is not my idea. This comes from Designing Your Life. It's a great book um, by Evans and Burnett. that, that This really hammers home this idea that we do have more than one option. You know, we get to pick what we want to do. And then I like to see who are some of those people living, kind of crossing over some of those different lives. Like, for instance, I ran into the VP of a a giant tech company who happens to be 
you know, a major coach player and also an author. And she's got her own coaching practice on the side that's global and things like that. So that's a person I would identify as someone I want to talk to so that I can keep in touch with them. And it starts off with just checking in and saying, you know, do you have 10 minutes of time for coffee? That kind of thing, right? Very basic informational interview. I'd love to hear about your career. And then I create a Google alert generally if they're famous or something. And I try to keep track of what they're up to. I also try to ping them every now and then and just see, oh, if I saw an article, or if I wrote something, or if then it's about giving them value because they were nice enough to take out time for me. Sometimes, usually when I'm networking, I'll ask them to connect me to one more person that they think would be helpful. So that gives me one more chance to reach back out to them. Once I've spoken to the other person, I'll circle back to thank them. And, and that way uh, they remember who I am. And then I just keep keep in touch. So um, my relationships with, with these kinds of folks last for years and years and years. And, uh, and it's just six months, maybe a Christmas card, maybe uh, just to check in. One time, I mean, I laughed, one of my mentors won an award and I got it out of my Google alert, it popped up. <laughs> so I congratulated him for it and he had not even been notified of the award yet. Oh. And uh, <laughs> so, I mean, so that touches somebody because you're like, this person is really, like I've helped them, but how many people have actually like kept track of my life and my accomplishments? And mm-hmm. um, so I get that all the time from people who, you know, you're the only one that's ever come up and actually kind of thanked me after a presentation. I'm like, are you serious? Um, it doesn't take a whole lot. So if you're at a conference, you know, rather than asking questions and demanding things and whatnot, but just, you know, just acknowledging how much hard work they put into what they've done. Do you actually send people Christmas cards? Like, are your mentors on your Christmas card list? Yeah. Interesting. I don't do it every year, though. I'm a rebel. If you know Gretchen Rubin's styles, I'm a <laughs> rebel. I do not do anything consistently, but uh, when I do do them, I have a lot of people, a lot of mentors on there. Wait, now I'm curious about this. You're a rebel. What What does this mean? This I do not know okay. Gretchen style. You, let, let's sure. get into it. Sure. So there's four different tendencies, and I'll just spell them out, and people probably know what they are, but she has a quiz if you want to take them. A rebel is somebody who you can't tell me what to do because I can't even tell myself what to do. Um, I struggle against internal expectations and external expectations. A questioner is somebody that will struggle against both as well, but will concede once they realize why they need to do something. So once you explain to a questioner and they understand why they have to do something, they will do it. If they can convince themselves why they have to do it, they will do it. Okay. I think the that's third me. style, that might be you. Yes. Yeah. So the third <laughs> style is, is an upholder. That person, once they've decided it's good and they write it down, come hell or high water, you can't stop them. They're going to get that thing done. And then the other group, which is the dominant group, is the obliger, which is I'll show up if you need me. If you need me to, if a part of a book club, a running club, if my boss has a deadline, if my kids need me, if someone else. So I'm not good with my own internal expectations, but for other people's expectations, I will show up. Now, you now this is an interesting question which are from your experience who are the leaders that what category do leaders usually fall under oh the full range oh the full range full, full range full oh range. interesting there's but, no like dominant group that's interesting well the, the vast majority of humans are obligers are obligers okay and the vast minority are rebels and upholders they're like maybe 5% 10% each i think gretchen might have better numbers on this than me mm. she's done all the studies but. okay Vast majority are obligers. Ah, interesting. Okay. So wait, do you cognizantly not send out a Christmas card every year? Like, is it like, I don't do this because I don't do it? Or do you just do it because you just forget? Yeah, it's just my mood. I, I, <laughs> I, I trust I trust that nobody will be upset if I didn't give them one this year. So I don't feel a, a whole lot of pressure or obligation around it. That's pretty good. And uh, when I'm into it, I do it. Well, that's funny. Yeah, because I like... I call people a lot and people get freaked out because I'm like, nobody calls anybody anymore. But like, I'm just like, I'll call, I'll call you out of the blue. Just like, Oh, I thought of you. So like, I decided to call you today. Um, (laughs) but that's, that's interesting. It's good to, it's good to delve into those kind of mindset. We, we have, yeah, we've just been really like going through a lot of these like personality traits and things. So I'm just always curious, like what, um, how, okay. Can I ask you a question then a personal question is like when you, read this book or research or whatever Gretchen Mm. created, did you feel better understanding this like mindset that you were in, that you were a rebel? Like, did it help with clarity of your life? 
I, I took the test three times and tried to game it so that I wouldn't be a rebel. <laughs> and uh, every single time I ended up as a rebel. <laughs> ah. So it was not something that made me happy, but it helped me understand sort of why I struggle with myself sometimes. Ah. So what it was so then I followed her advice. I got some structure. You know, I hired a personal assistant to call me every night to ask me twenty questions of my choosing. And uh, he com- he uh, demands scores on how well I did to do push-ups and sit-ups and jumping jacks and meditation and this and that. And that has done wonders for my life because huh. I knew that me leaving it to my own whim and fancy is not really going to get the trick done. And uh, see, Ben Franklin came up with this idea of asking yourself questions around values. But he was an upholder, so he could just keep his own list and he was fine. <laughs> Another guy came along many years later, Marshall Goldsmith, who's a mentor of mine, and he coaches people at the World Bank and the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, all these things. And he's like, Vic, we're so weak. You know, we need help. We can't do this on our own. We're going to fail this test if you try this on your own. He's been doing it for 40 years now. He's had a personal assistant call him every day for about 40 years. And, uh, and I asked him, how much money are you spending on this thing, Marshall? It's probably so expensive. He's like... It's a dumb question, Vic. It's how much time have I spent on my values and my priorities, and the money is inconsequential. And it's true. So when I and I spend a hundred bucks a month on Philip calling me every night, and um, it's done wonders for me, and it's allowed me to realize what a good life looks like, and um, it challenges my rebel nature. Now some days I skip the call, but he still gets paid. Some days I have penalties attached, you know. So it helps me, and it also helps a lot of my clients who are perhaps rebels struggling with commitments, not realizing why, or people who are like in conflict, right? Upholders and rebels are in conflict all the time because they just don't understand each other. Like, how can you just be so intractable that you wrote it down, you're just going to stick with it. You're not going to be flexible at all. Mm-hmm. And the rebel's like, oh, I'll get that to you by the end of the day, but you don't see it for a week. And it's like, how could you be so disrespectful that you wouldn't even get it to me on time? And so you see these things all the time. And so that's been helpful. Interesting. That's uh, fascinating. Um, all right. Well, I uh, I don't I-, I wanted to ask this question, and this is really a question I wanted to start asking all my guests. Is like, what's a question or a topic that we didn't discuss that you think we that our listeners should know? I think this whole idea of coaching is still so amorphous for a lot of listeners, and I think uh, the key that I would want to share is that you really can start to coach yourself. I mean, as you coach yourself, you're able to then coach others. So figuring out ways to be more curious with yourself, to, to listen, to be a little bit less judgmental. Uh, and the reason it's so important is, you know, it's the Gall- it's, Gallup research has shown that it's the manager. Every organization is going to be made or broken by the quality of its manager. And the best managers are going to be the best coaches. But the problem is most of us don't really know what coaching is. And so how are we supposed to be good coaches? Right. So by by learning more about it, by coaching yourself, by finding a way to get resourced around coaching, all of that will allow you to be just a a better coach, leader, person, you know, human, parent, all this stuff. (laughs) Um, So I I guess that's the point I would want to make. And a question um, that I would be asking, I think you asked some lovely questions. Um, to your point about in, whether to invest in a company or whether to take off, I think I would want to know, like, how much do you care about values, right? Like, how mm-hmm. important are the values of the company or the organization? How important are your own values to you? Um, are those discernible, right? Because for me, they're very strong. I worked at places like the UN and FEMA, places that are really about social services and things like that. Other folks, are they just love uh, making money. And that's good too, right? No shame. Right, no in shame in that. Yeah. So I think just recognizing what, what are the values? How do they um, interplay? How can you be happy um, if there is a misalignment in values? Because again, we're always iterating, evolving, trying to get to the next place. Uh, so so how to be patient and, and kind of curious in that process too. Great. Uh, it can be very important, yeah. And uh, yeah, if people want to find you, people want to find this rebel. Where where can they find this <laughs> rebel at? Yeah, find me on LinkedIn. Vic Kapoor would be great. And um, extra-m.com is my website. Okay, cool. We'll include it in the show notes. And uh, yeah, thanks, Vic, for uh, taking the time. And, you know, thanks for coming on.